In the last episode of Lest We Forget, we discovered more about Ellen White's family and the challenges she faced, starting with her younger sister, Lizzie. Elizabeth, as near as we can tell, had no interest at all in spiritual things. If you'll recall, uh, when the family became Millerites and were expelled from the Methodist Church, Elizabeth was um, on examination to become a member of the Methodist Church. Why she did not go ahead and join like Ellen did, it could well be, we don't know, we'll find out in heaven, there's no records that we know of, but it could be all the fighting with the father turned uh, Lizzie off to religion completely, or, you know, organized formal religion. Her Reuben uh, Banks, uh, he was not spiritually inclined as near as we could tell. We learned of Ellen's efforts to comfort her sister Lizzie during the loss of her little daughter Ava. During this time, Ellen sought to draw her sister's attention to Jesus, to put her faith in him so that she could be reunited with Ava in the resurrection at his return. I think this is a sister reaching out to her twin sister, trying to find some hook to get her twin sister's attention to get her to think spiritually. And the thought that maybe she could see her little baby again might be that hook. Apparently it didn't work. Um, as far as we know, there was no change. With the exception of Lizzie, all of Ellen White's family members placed their faith in Jesus. Trusting that God cared for them, Ellen and James White traveled to preach the gospel and gratefully embraced the help of the Howland family to care for Henry, their firstborn son, and later their other children as well. She saw no alternative because if she didn't, she and James were out trying to move between the churches, there was no way to establish the church. Henry grew up knowing Jesus as his savior, but at the age of 16, he died early of pneumonia. And just be shortly before he dies, he says to his uh, mother, when I die, promise me that you will not bury me here, but that you will take me to Battle Creek and bury me next to my little brother, John Herbert. He did not want John Herbert coming up in the resurrection alone, having no idea that his other two brothers, or his parents would both die, his other two brothers would die, and many thousands of Adventist saints would die. But the reality of the second coming was so real to Henry that he wanted to make certain that when his little baby twin, or his little baby brother came up in the resurrection, that he would not be alone in that cemetery plot, that there would be someone next to him. A couple focused on the mission of their savior and clinging to Jesus while facing griefs and great difficulty. Those were the Whites. In today's episode, we explore more stories of sacrifice and trial among the Adventist pioneers. Sacrifice. It's a word that is full of meaning, and yet it's one that's strange to many of us today. For this final episode, we're going to examine stories of sacrifice through our early history. Our pioneers faced tremendous adversity in following their convictions. These difficulties could come from human or even supernatural sources. But even in the midst of difficulty and suffering, God is present, and His grace and power provide for his work. What is the story about the famous potato patch? Most of you have probably told the story at some point of Leonard Hastings. 
the man who, one of several Millerites, who left his potatoes in the field in 1844, in the fall of 1844, rather than digging them, because he believed the Lord was coming, and it was a testimony of his faith to not dig his potatoes. His neighbors would come and say, oh, let us dig them. No, no, you're not going to need them either. And, you know, you're... You, you, you don't need but you don't need potatoes I don't need potatoes so uh, they were left in the ground that um, that fall a blight the same blight that got the potatoes in Ireland and wrecked the potatoes in Ireland and many Irish came to America because of the virtual famine in Ireland at this during these years that potato blight got over here to America and for several years, all the potatoes that were dug ended up, or practically all of them, ended up rotting until they finally figured out what was going on and got it stopped. Leonard Hastings, by not digging his potatoes, leaving them in the ground, didn't realize that it was protecting the potatoes. So later in the season, or early the next year, when he went out and looked around, his potatoes had not frozen and they had not rotted like the ones that had been dug and were in cellars. And he was able to sell them for much more money for, uh, for seed potatoes the following year. So in effect, he was blessed by his statement of faith or by leaving his potatoes in the field because he thought the Lord was coming uh, in 1844. And so he refused to have them dug. We're now talking 1844, of course, for not digging his potatoes. Very soon after this, Leonard Hastings and his wife, Elvira, accepted the Sabbath and they accepted the visions of Ellen White. When Elvira died in, I forgot, it was 1851, 50, 51, somewhere in there, this was devastating. There were maybe 150 Sabbath keepers by this time. So we had very few, and she died, I think it was appendicitis, if I remember correctly. Um, but this was devastating. Number one, it was the first of these early believers to die. Second, there were not that many of them, so when she died, it was a, she was a good friend of Ellen White's. This was difficult for Ellen White also when Elvira died. And um, he was left with a couple of children to raise. As far as I know, he never remarried. So this was a, kind of a blow for them because even though the Lord had not come in 1844, they seem, I, I, I don't know if they ever taught this, but they kind of thought they were all going to live until the Lord came. and. Then Elvira died, so it was kind of a rude awakening for them that the Lord was was delaying his coming a bit longer, and uh, there were going to be some deaths. Well, of course, now there've been earlier. Leonard Hastings had left his uh, church here in New Ipswich, of which he was a member, when he became a Millerite. And I would like to read you his letter that he wrote when he resigned his church membership to the Orthodox Christian Church in New Ipswich. It is addressed to the Orthodox Congregational Church at New Ipswich, New Hampshire, and it's dated September 17, 1843. Here is sentence number one. Believing as I do that the second advent of the Lord in 1843 is plainly and clearly taught in the gospel, and also the Christian perfection or sanctification is required of us in God's word, that in and through the atonement of the Lord Jesus there is ample provision made for our sanctification and full redemption in this world. And knowing, and this is still the first sentence, and knowing as I do that as a church you do regret and make light of these glorious truths and even say that men may go on sinning to heaven and also that Christ cannot come in the clouds of heaven these thousand years. Well, we finally came to a comma. I therefore feel it my duty in compliance with what God says by John the Revelator, come out of her my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues, do request of you that my name be erased from the church record, as I shall no longer consider myself a member of your church. Now, as I say, I like to suggest to teachers that they have their students diagram that sentence. All right, here's the second sentence, but in, in all seriousness, these people were in earnest. And you can feel the earnestness in, in their passion in the, what they write. Here's the second sentence. I feel that I do this in conformity to the requirements of the great head of the church. And now in his name I beseech you all not to make light any more of the coming of the blessed Lord. For at the appointed time he will come and not tarry. 
All the unbelief of the world will not stop him. So do get ready by making a full consecration of yourselves to the living God, for as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That was the second sentence. So whether you agree with his grammar, you must at least acknowledge his passion for sharing his faith that Jesus was about to return as he understood it. He signed it yours in the belief of the coming of Christ in 1843, Leonard Hastings. Sometimes a great spiritual ally begins as an opponent. Such was the experience of John Loughborough when he met Sabbath keepers for the first time. Jan Loughborough was a Sunday keeping Adventist, lived in Baldwin, New York, which is a little bit to the south of us. And just a few days before his 17th birthday, John Loughborough decided to go preaching. Now Loughborough was a small man physically, but he was a powerfully large man when it came to his accomplishments. Anyway, he uh, decides to be a preacher. He's not quite 17, just a few days before his 17th birthday. And he tells us he only had notes for two or three sermons. And somebody gave him a coat that was way too big for him because he was such a small man. And an uncle gave him $3, probably something like this, a $3 bill. We had interesting currency back in those days. A $3 bill, gave him $3 to help him get started. And off he went to begin to preach. Now, as he preached, he was preaching Sunday, of course. He's a Sunday-keeping Adventist. And some of his converts here in Rochester went to hear another young man preach. And the other young man's name was John Andrews. And so someone came to Loughborough and said, you need to get over there and listen to this Andrews guy because he's getting a number of your converts to join him on the Seventh-day Sabbath. So Loughborough decided, well, I can take this guy on. I'll, I'll make quick work of this and we'll just be done with it. And so he makes a list of the texts that he thinks proves that Sunday is the Sabbath. And he goes, as he would later tell the story, he goes to listen to John Andrews. Well, if you picked up anything that I've said about John Andrews, you've got to be pretty good to outwit the man. And John Andrews, I don't suppose he even knew what was happening. But Loughborough said, you know, I had all these texts written down that I was going to use to defend my view on Sunday sacredness. and. Andrews just worked right down the list as though he had the list in front of him. And I was checking him off. Oh, well, that didn't say what I thought. It oh, and, that, and by the time the, the meeting was over, guess who was converted? It was Loughborough was converted to the Sabbath. So he shows up here in Rochester in December of 1852, uh, just newly convinced about the Seventh-day Sabbath. He's young. He's a minister. He's been a Sunday keeping Adventist minister for several years. And he comes under the conviction that he should go preach. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any uh, resources because we didn't pay ministers in those days. When he came under conviction in the first place that he should start preaching these new truths that he had learned, he had about $35, which was a fair amount of money in those days, but nothing was breaking for him. He is not getting any more sales. He sold sash locks, you know, locks for your windows. Here is a picture. He, owned, he sold Arnold Patton sash locks. Here is a picture, a wood, oh, an engraving, I mean a woodcut, not an engraving, a woodcut of an Arnold Patton sash lock that uh, showed up in the Genesee Farmer from that era. So this is uh, what, he, what Loughborough was selling, were locks for your windows, to lock your windows like uh, this one. And uh, so nothing is happening. He's not having any sales. Everything's going wrong. Ellen White has a vision that he should go preach but he doesn't quite have the nerve to go and his money is going down, 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 down to where he has almost nothing left. And uh, finally, he's down to where he says, I had just made a commitment to the Lord, I'd go preach, but still nothing's breaking for him. And one day his wife, Mary, comes to her husband and says to her husband, I need to go to shopping. I need to do a little shopping. I and he says, well, what do you need? Well, I need some matches and I need some thread. And so her husband reaches into his pocket and pulls out a silver three cent coin, which we were minting in the United States in those days, pulls out a three cent piece and says to his wife, "Here's this is all the money we have. Take it, buy one penny's worth of matches and one penny's worth of thread 
and bring me back one penny. This is the size of our pennies in those days, our cents. Bring back one so we're not totally broke. Well, she goes off shopping. And while she's gone, there is a knock on the door and a man comes and says, I understand that you sell Arnold Patton sash locks. And Loughborough said, yes, I do. And this man said, well, I am going to Ohio and I would like to buy an assortment of them so that I can become a dealer there. And uh, so would you uh, get a selection of different styles and kinds of locks that this company makes and, uh, and I'll buy them from you. And so the man buys $80 worth of sash locks. All Loughborough had to do was walk about a half a mile to the factory, get the locks, come back, and then sell them to the man, and he made $26 on the sale. So when, he came, when his wife came home with her penny, whatever I did with it, here it is, with her penny, one penny that was left, why he's singing, he's happy. She can't imagine because she thinks they're out of money. That's all they have left. And she finds her husband happy and he tells her what happened while she was gone and how the Lord had honored his promise that he would go and be a full-time preacher. And John Loughborough from 1852 until his death in 1924 was a Seventh-day Adventist or Sabbath keeping and then later Seventh-day Adventist uh, minister. While Adventists realized that printing was God's plan to get his word out, the struggle to begin the process was very real. It was in Rochester that we first had our printing press that was bought back in 1852. Hiram Edson had sold his farm and he had some money and he advanced the money to buy the press until they could repay him. The first issue of the Review and Herald that came off of that hand press was volume three, number two, which is dated May 27, 1852. Now it just looks like a kind of a browned old paper to you, but can you imagine what it must have been for those young people, all in their teens and some in their 20s, when the first issue of the paper came off of a press that they owned with type that they owned, that they had set. I mean, it had to be a very, very exciting day for those young people that were living here on Mount Hope Avenue in Rochester, New York. So this is the first issue of the paper. They had hoped to have it out, I mean, have the press from New York City by the time of the first issue, but it didn't quite arrive in time. So the second issue is the first one that was printed on that press. Now things are pretty primitive with that press. And I would like to read to you what Uriah Smith, who was one of those young people wrote many years later about that first press. He says, I often think of the time when Elder Jane Loughborough and a few others in Rochester, New York, under the direction of Brother James White, were preparing the first tracks to be sent out to the people. The instruments we had were a brad awl, a straight edge, and a penknife. Brother Loughborough with the awl would perforate the backs for stitching. The sisters would trim the rough edges on the top, front, and bottom. We blistered our hands in the operation, and often the tracks in form were not half so true and square as the doctrines they taught. Now let me illustrate what he's talking about. Here's an issue of the youth instructor that was printed on that first hand press. And you can see how rough the edges are. He's describing how they just slit them with a knife, a pen knife he calls it, but just a knife, and the edges are quite rough. They're not trimmed properly like you would do with a properly trimmed book. And as far as the stitching is concerned, I bring this, I usually take this copy along because the back covers are missing, and you can see the stitching where the ladies, they were involved also, the young ladies, and so uh, Elder Loughborough would take a punch, or he calls it an awl, or Smith calls it an awl, punch the holes, and the sisters then would stitch the pamphlets together. So you can get the idea of the rough edges and the way they were sewn together because they didn't yet know how to bind hardback binding books. They had to do those commercially when they did it. So those are some early materials printed on that first press. Either the first or the second pamphlet that was actually printed on the hand press was this one written by Jane Andrews 
of review of the remarks of O.R.L. Crozier, the author of the Sanctuary Doctrine uh, article, but he had turned against the Sabbath by this point. A review of the remarks of O.R.L. Crozier on the institution, design, and abolition of the Sabbath. So he's refuting. Here's young John Andrews refuting O.R.L. Crozier, even at a very early date. Wow. We've seen the pioneers struggling financially, with few resources and a mission to accomplish. But not all their challenges were material. Sometimes, the devil got involved more directly. Something interesting happened in that house as uh, Elder Andrews was working on his History of the Sabbath. And I want to read you the story as it was told to me by John Andrews' uh, great-grandson. John Andrews was working on his book, The History of the Sabbath, and while he was writing the book here in Lancaster, North Lancaster, he had an impression that the devil was going to make an attempt on his life. At the time of the incident, Charles Andrews, that was the grandfather of the person that wrote this out for me, told me the story and then wrote it out, and Charles was the son of Jay and Andrews. At the time of the incident, Charles Andrews, then a young boy, was in the room with his father, John Nevins. He heard steps and saw the door open and then close. Then he heard steps coming into the house. His father, that would be Jay and Andrews, his father said, Oh God, take the sight of him away from me. He no longer saw him, but felt the grip of his hands around his throat, and he called out, Oh Charles, pray for me. And Charles did, and the devil left. But Elder Andrews was sick for several days, and he had the marks of the devil's fingers on his throat. Charles did not see the devil but heard the steps and saw the door open and close, and it made an impression on him. After it was over, his father told him how the devil came into the room dressed in gray. He had to stoop to get in the door. He had piercing eyes and a hateful and angry expression on his face as he came toward Elder Andrews. His countenance was fierce and determined as he advanced. Charles told his grandson, who wrote this out for me, that was the first time I had ever been called upon to pray for anyone in my life. Now, I realize that some of you come from parts of the world where concerns with devils, devil worship, all these kind of experiences are still very common. But it does remind us that Satan hates the Sabbath and was more than willing to try to kill Elder Andrews, if possible, just to prevent this book from even being written. So we are as Seventh-day Adventists. We have, uh, you know, right embedded in our name, Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day Sabbath. And uh, no wonder the devil is angry with our church and trying to thwart our work around the world at every turn that he can. So that little story happened there also in that uh, house. One of the great challenges that always accompanies spreading the gospel is how to reach areas where opposition to the message can be overtly hostile. Adventists felt a deep need to reach and make education available for African Americans who were oppressed in the South following the Civil War. Edson White was moved to take up the challenge. In the fall of 1893, Edson White and his friend W.O. Palmer attended a ministerial institute in Battle Creek. Now, if you remember, Edson had been sort of wandering spiritually in the wilderness for a period of time but he's at this institute and there he learns about some uh, manuscripts that his mother had written and uh, it it revitalizes his spiritual life and he gives his heart to the Lord these uh, manuscripts that uh, his mother had written were a call to evangelize the former slaves in the southern United States Edson decides this is his mission in life. This is what he needs to do. And he also, uh, one sentence according to this article that especially energized him was the call from his mother to start small schools uh, in, the, in the South uh, for the, to teach the children of those former slaves. And they concluded that they needed to go South. He and Palmer decided they needed to go South and carry out this mandate. They wrote a book called The Gospel Primer, which they sold many, many thousands of copies of. Uh, I mean, not just they, but the church. And uh, proceeds from that book helped fund the ministry to go south, to build the boat, etc. The two men, as they began to investigate about this new dream they had to go south, 
soon learned that if they tried to evangelize, to educate uh, blacks in the South, they would be run out of town. They would not be allowed to live there. And so Edson got another idea. If I can't have a house, I'll build a boat and I will have my house on the boat. And if they come after me, I'll just pull my anchor up and I'll float on down the river. And that will resolve that situation. So they, he had the dream then to build the boat. They started building the boat actually in Battle Creek. And then they brought the, um, the hull over here. And, um, and then they built it on the, on the banks of the Kalamazoo River. Now I've been told that it was on the south side of the Kalamazoo River, not far from the bridge that we came across. So my guess is that somewhere where all these trees are, there used to be some sheds there where the boat was actually constructed. So this is the way it originally looked when they finished it here and shipped it or floated it down the Kalamazoo River to Lake Michigan. So when the construction was finished, as I've mentioned, White and his crew sailed the Morning Star down the Kalamazoo River to Lake Michigan, where a larger lake steamer towed it across to Chicago. A big storm came up and they thought they were going to lose it. They almost lost the ship getting it across uh, Lake Michigan. And then from there they steamed through the Illinois and Michigan Canal to the Illinois River and finally to the Mississippi River. At various stops along the way, new volunteers joined the crew and uh, Edson needed to um, have something to house these people on so he got him another little uh, boat that he towed along behind it and so if the first boat is the Morning Star they named the other one the Dawn. So the missionaries reached Vicksburg in January of 1895 where they immediately began evangelistic visits, um, meetings, and night school where children of former slaves and some of their parents and grandparents learned reading and spelling and sang lively gospel music. Within a few months, they purchased land and built a little church. In 1896, I've just got two more paragraphs to read this article. In 1896, having proved the practicality of the ship, Edson overhauled it with a new engine and boiler, lengthened the hull, allowing a deck of 105 feet or 32 meters, and added a new second deck as living quarters, uh, which had a study in it, a bedroom, clothes closets, bathroom. Behind those rooms uh, were a chapel and a reading room and then they remodeled the lower floor that they'd had originally and that's where they had a printing office with two small presses powered by steam from the ship's boiler. And from this small base he published the Southern work and a monthly periodical which he called the Gospel Herald. So when they got through the second, the ship now looks like this. So this is the Morning Star after it has enlarged. Edson and Emma made their home on the Morning Star until the summer of 1899 in 1900, they moved to Nashville and the star went into semi-retirement at a nearby anchorage on the Cumberland River. The, mo the boat made one more noteworthy voyage. In June of 1904, it carried E.A. Sutherland, P.T. McGann, and Ellen White up the Cumberland River in search of land on which to establish a school, which became Madison College, Madison Sanitarium, etc. In 1905, Edson had the star hauled onto the riverbank to be used for an office, but not long afterward, it burned. Its bell and metal star, and I guess a chair or two off of it, can still be seen at Oakwood, well, it says college here, but it's now Oakwood University. So the beginning of that ministry, which has so impacted the work in North America, I mean, if you think about if you know anything about especially the work among African Americans in North America, why all the major, major evangelists and preachers and stuff, they all trace their ancestry back to Edson, this fellow who had such a rough time with his spiritual experience for so long, then caught a vision. Ellen White was in Australia and she was ecstatic when she heard that he had finally turned himself around because she had prayed, she had written, she had talked with him when she was around him, praying for this, this fellow who has so much talent, but just didn't seem to know how to harness it and focus it on something positive. And so he made a, a major contribution to the church, especially here in North America. But when you stop to think about the number of African Americans who have gone overseas as missionaries, you realize that Edson's, the impact of Edson's ministry is much larger than just North America, as important as it has been 
to what um, to the work here in North America. So it's a, a picture here of a man who uh, took a while to find his role in life, but he eventually did. Here is a picture of Edson and his wife, Emma. She died in 1916. So he didn't die until 1928. During this series, we have traveled through stories of the beginning of our church. What strikes me most powerfully is the fact that God can and will use anyone who responds with truth and an honest heart. The journey is often difficult and contains many unexpected twists and turns that test faith and require sacrifice. But God is faithful and He leads His people forward. We hope this series has given you a sense of God's working in the history of our movement and challenged you to embrace the journey of sharing Jesus with others, whether they're your family, friends, neighbors, or people you have not met in places you have never been. Even so, come Lord Jesus.